Hi, Misha here. And this is one that I've been looking forward to the beginning for quite some time, but I was waiting on some extra pieces to come in. But essentially, I had to uh, special order because there's not just a whole lot of options when it comes to British aircraft, especially jets. You can find a decent number of Spitfires and Hurricanes and all of that from World War II period, even stuff with camels and so on from World War I. But once you get past those periods, you don't find a lot. Even ones like this. There's not that many models of. This is kind of the overview video. Kind of off the cuff, not really trying to give data now. I will do individuals. This is just my thoughts kind of acquiring these. Why I like them. Giving you an upcoming preview. Most everyone on the table is from Corgi. And that makes sense because they're an English company. So it would make sense that they would focus on English planes. All are die cast. All are 172 scale. And everything on the table here is a jet. Running from World War II all the way to the present day. So just to kind of give you a, a peek at what we're going to be talking about. On this end we've got the Gloucester Meteor. And one thing I like about how the Brits named, designated their planes, they obviously had marks and, you know, one, two, three, fours for each variation, but they actually gave them true proper names. And that was what they were primarily known as. Not like America, where we go with just numbers, or even Russia. I mean, there's a you know a, a sub name uh, we use, like F-16 Falcon, but you know most people call it the F-16. The British tend to still like to do the name. The meteor is actually very historically important. Everyone thinks of the Messerschmitt 262 and they think of jet fighters of World War II. And it was the first to really go into full operation. But really the Meteor was right there with it. They started working on this in 1940. They were flying it by early 43. And it was in service by 44. But it didn't get as much acclaim because they really kept it in England. They didn't send it much into Europe. Also, while it is a jet, with two jet engines, in other ways it's a very conventional design with a straight wing and all of that. This was primarily armed with 20mm cannon and could also use rockets. And um, even though it was a World War II design, they would keep making these through the mid-50s and even keep them in service through the late 50s. And they would make a large number, nearly 4,000. So it's was, it was quite a, you know, quite a successful design, really. Moving on, behind it here, we have its contemporary in a lot of ways. This is the De Havilland Vampire. This project began just a short time after the Gloucester Meteor, 1941, give or take, and actually it flew for the first time the same year, 1943, just about six months later. And originally this wasn't meant to go into production, it was just kind of a backup and an experimental plane they could work with. But it proved so decent that in 44 they ordered it into production. 
and uh, it's very similar to the Meteor in performance, still a straight wing, but it has one engine versus two, and so that was kind of a, it was really the first production single engine jet. And it was a little bit slower than the Meteor, but not by a whole lot. And it has the kind of a P-38 style tail boom, which is neat. It's a very small plane, and actually it was used quite extensively by the Royal Navy, the version at least, the Sea Vampire. Well, these would go into production in 46 and service, but actually wouldn't be produced for all that long. Started hard to be pulled out by the end of the Korean War. That said, they still made over 3,000 of them. Moving right along here. I think this is a cool plane. This is the Hawker Hunter. Now my version here is actually the two-seater, which was mostly used for training, but also ground attack. Most of the standard versions I'm going to kind of get like this, guys, just, just like, you know, so on and so forth. This was a post-war design that first flew in the early 50s. It would go into service right after Korea in 1954. And actually would stay in service for quite a very long time in one capacity or another. The previous ones we looked at were very much subsonic. This was what they would start to call transonic. It would just right there bump the, the sound barrier. It's quite a more large plane. As you see it, it has a swept wing. And a very neat model. It's a relatively re recent acquisition for me. Back here, this big one, is the English Electric, that's the company's name, Lightning. And this was a Mach 2, high speed obviously, high altitude interceptor. It was very advanced for its day. It was tested in the mid-50s, went into service in 59, and was kept in RAS service through the late 80s. It really only has two big missiles, although it had two other hard points, mostly used for fuel tanks. It was originally made to defend airfields and stuff from bombers. It has a very unique vertical engine arrangement and uh, was relatively short range especially early versions but it was really fast and its missiles were very powerful which is good because it only had two they were using 20 millimeter cannon cannons early on but these last couple here we were starting to go to a 30 millimeter cannon but they're still very much in use it would be very successful would make all that many, about three or four hundred, but enough for the RAF's needs. And it's a very iconic British plane, and it's really the only truly British Mach 2 capable fighter jet. It actually replaced a very short lived plane called the Javelin. This is actually the one that came today. I had to special order this from England. This is the Blackburn Buccaneer. This is a Navy strike bomber. It was originally made for the Royal Navy at any rate. They would adopt it in 1962. And it was designed to kind of attack Soviet vessels. They could either carry a nuclear weapon or conventional. Much like an F-105 
It has an internal bomb bay. It also has external hard points. So it could carry a decent amount. Relatively large craft. And that was kind of its downfall in the RE in the, in the Navy because when they retired their big old carriers they could no longer really use this so they retired it in the late 70s. The RAF looked at it in the 60s. At first they didn't want it at all, but when their first two choices fell through they ended up adopting it themselves in the late 60s, 69 I believe. And um, they would keep flying it through the 80s and finally retire it after the Cold War was over in the 90s. Behind it here, I have a neat little plane. This is the British Aerospace Hawk. And this is actually what they call an advanced trainer. Small little plane. It's a two-seater. It was developed in the 60s. And what was neat, they put it into service in the early 70s. Still in service today. They produced a lot of them. I believe over a thousand. They had a lot of foreign customers. It was a good export for Britain. Uh, it was actually able to be used as a light fighter. It has hard points under the wings. It can be fitted with cannon. So it wasn't exclusively a trainer. It was a small, nimble little plane. It was rather, just, just barely uh, supersonic, but it did the job. Actually, I think maybe it was right under. I know it was right in that transonic range. Sorry. But, you know, it was, it was reasonably fast for what it was. And it was very customizable and upgradable. It's also famous for being flown by the Red Arrows acrobatic team. Those have all been Corgi. Here we have the first Hobby Master. This is the Harrier. Specifically, this is a Sea Harrier. Uh, short takeoff and landing or vertical takeoff and landing. Quite possibly the most famous British jet since the Lightning or even of the post-Cold War era. The original Harrier for the RAF was tested in the 60s and was officially adopted on April Fool's Day of 1969. The Sea Harrier would come a bit later in the late 70s. Both would be used in the Falklands War 1982 kind of interesting because these were subsonic, relatively small craft at a time when American craft were getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. But not the Harrier. This is also what allowed the British Navy to kind of get rid of their full-size carriers and go to the small, you know, escort type because this didn't require near as much space. And there are several versions of the Harrier over the years. Very famous British aircraft. This is a pretty recent Hobbymaster model release, too. It uh, just came out in 2019. Moving on, we have the Seaprica Jaguar. This is the training version, so two seater. Most of the military ones just had a single seat. I kind of liked having the training because originally this was going to be a trainer in the 80s and the 60s when they were planning it. But then they changed the design, what they wanted. They wanted it to be supersonic, kind of a strike fighter bomber. This was also a joint project between France and the UK. And a very successful one. These flew in Desert Storm and weren't retired until 2007 in Britain has a reasonably large payload underneath. It was the first joint product, but definitely not the last. Moving on here, we have the Panavia Tornado. 
or tornado as most people say. This is a swing wing plane, kind of like the F-111. And like the F-111, it has kind of rotating ordnance under the wings. It has two hard points under each wing. This was a joint project between Britain, West Germany, and Italy. And was likewise a very capable aircraft. Again, it had quite a large payload and was quite flexible and versatile. And then to wrap things up, we have the so called Eurofighter or Typhoon, if you want to be more up to date. Yet another joint project fighter. It really dates back to the end of the Cold War in the 1980s. Originally, it was with the uh, UK, France, West Germany, Italy, and now Spain. However, France would drop out, leaving the others. This would first have a prototype flight in 94, but then politics and other things and last-minute changes would prevent it from going into service until 2003. But it's in service today. And with nearly 600 or more built, at least it did finally get off the ground. As you see, it's a Delta Wing. It does have some stealth capabilities. It has massive amounts of ordnance possible underneath, up to, I think, uh, over a dozen hard points. It's fast. It has a very high altitude, 65,000 feet. It is definitely the closest thing and very much a legitimate rival to modern American planes like the F-22 or even F-35. And also like those, it, can, it proves that not only is it America that can just blow lots of money and time on a project. This had its own political and other controversies in Europe for a long time. That said, it is a really cool looking plane. I like the way it looks more than the F-35 if that matters, but I think the Raptor is the coolest of them all, but I digress. So there you kind of go. You can see the progression. From the early straight wings here, they were faster than the old props, but not by a heck of a lot. Through the sweep wings of the 50s, 60s, the interceptors, the strikers, designed at the heat of the Cold War. And then you get into more of the multi-role ground attack craft, and of course the phase where Britain cooperated with its other European neighbors and allies, which is a whole... Hey, they managed to do it for a long time. That's probably more than most countries could get away with, right? So, good on them for actually making it work, even if at times I'm sure it was kind of a hair-pulling experience. So, like I said, I'll pick up with individual videos giving more detail and stuff I just I'm really excited to do this one because the British planes are very unique and often overlooked in America plus I really like how Corgi does them I mean they're not perfect none of the model makers are everyone has pros and cons but all in all I like Corgi's price point and I like what you get and they're very heavy metal. Most all of these are solid metal. They're not hollow in the middle. Now, most of them, the cockpit doesn't open. It does on the Lightning, though, which is kind of neat. In fact, one neat thing about the Lightning, it came with a little ladder for the pilot, too. It's so tall, even the little man needed one, I guess. And several of them have articulation. For example... The horizontals on the Jaguar move up and down. The wings go 
in and out on the tornado and also the ordnance rotates on the wings and even the front horizontals flaps on the uh, Eurofighter, the Typhoon move. So pretty neat stuff. I'll show you more in the individual videos. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please do post them below and I'll do my best. And if you enjoyed this overview, be sure to check back for other videos or look back at my ones I've done on American, Japanese, and Russian planes. And I'm sure I'll keep doing them in the future because I find these videos oddly relaxing to do. <laughs> this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.